Hello, everyone, and welcome to this seminar arranged by the Consortium for Research on Terrorism and International Crime. Really happy to see so many here today. Um, I'm Rita Augusta Knudsen. I'm a senior researcher here at NUPI, and I'm managing the consortium together with Professor Tore Bjergo um, from CREX. Um, and uh, we are very pleased today to introduce uh, Charlie Winter as our speaker. He's a senior researcher at the International Centre for the Study of Radicalization and Political Violence at the King's College London. And he is one of the world's leading experts on everything to do with um, the Islamic State IS communications, messaging, uh, information warfare, inf information propaganda. Already in 2015, he published an in-depth study um, of uh, Islamic State communications based on one-year daily analysis of the organization's outputs. And he recently published an ICSR report on media jihad on the Islamic State's communications operations and information warfare. He's also published on a number of uh, related issues, such as IS depictions of children and youth, uh, socialization of children into IS, uh, women in IS. And um, besides, I think, being able to take a cool and clear-headed look uh, at the IS communications beyond the brutality, um, Charlie's research is able to uh, distill the informational components of this messaging, the strategy behind it, as well as the implications for counterterrorism and the likely future of the organization. Today, based on his long-term and extensive research, he will talk about IS current communications operations and um, look at uh, a likely operational trajectory for the organization. Uh, he will talk for around 35 minutes, so we'll have plenty of time for a question and discussion afterwards, and we'll finish at around 1.30. Um, I should mention that um, we normally don't record our consortium seminars, but today, due to the huge interest in this seminar, we will record it and uh, uh, make it into a podcast, provided there will be no technical difficulties. Um, I should also mention that Charlie will show some uh, video as part of his presentations. Uh, the, the last of the, um, this, uh, these videos has uh, some content that is upsetting but not graphic, and he will notice uh, you in advance of this uh, final video. Um, with this, I will only say welcome, Charlie. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Is this is it on? Can everyone? Okay. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that very generous introduction, and uh, thanks for hosting me here. It's great to be in Oslo. I've not been before. It looks pretty nice. Um, thank you everyone for coming along as well uh, to today to to listen to me talk about propaganda. I can talk about propaganda for days on end, and any opportunity I get to, I'm very happy to. So, thanks for um, thanks for coming along. So, as the title slide suggests, I'm going to be talking about the Islamic State and how it thinks about communication, how it thinks about communication through action and through the production of media, uh, and how it seeks to use that in order to perpetuate its existence, in order to simply survive even in and outside of Iraq and Syria. There are going to be three parts to my presentation. First, I'm going to talk about data that I've been collecting for the last few years. So I'm going to give a kind of longitudinal update to the project that, that Rita just spoke about earlier, of the 2015 uh, benchmark of Islamic State propaganda back then, and look at how it's changed over the course of the last couple of years, and how really the Islamic State today is a very different looking and different sounding organization than it was uh, a couple of years ago. Next, I'm going to talk about a couple of important trends that have been discernible in the Islamic State's communication probably for about 18 months now. Uh, they've become more and more apparent uh, over the last year. They're driven by the fact that it's struggling in Iraq and Syria, uh, or maybe struggled in Iraq and Syria. It's, it's lost its key uh, urban strongholds. I don't think it actually has any um, anymore. Uh, certainly in Iraq, Prime Minister Abadi just announced victory against the Islamic State. I think it's definitely premature, but 
what he was referring to is the fact that the organization doesn't control any more cities. Uh, similarly, in Syria, uh, it's not just the loss of Raqqa that, that matters, it's also Mayadeen, Abu Kamal, and so on. The Islamic State still has a presence in these countries, of course it does. They aren't in the cities, but they're still there. But essentially, the organization today is a very different organization. Again, very different looking, but also very different in terms of its existence to what it was uh, a couple of years ago. And that is reflected very clearly in its propaganda. In the last uh, bit, I'm going to briefly touch upon some implications. Uh, so talk about what any of this means. And then I'm going to um, show you just five minutes from a video that was released on the 28th of November that encapsulates very clearly uh, basically everything that I'm going to be saying in the meantime. Um, so it should be hopefully interesting uh, for you. I'm looking forward to the question and answers bit um, because I'm left with lots of questions as well uh, and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. So first of all for data, what do I mean by data? This is what I mean by data. This is uh, Telegram which is a social media platform that I'm sure lots of you are familiar with. Not just used by terrorists, it's very popular uh, among pro-democracy activists in places like Iran. But when I look at it, it's just looking at it in terms of how terrorists use it, and specifically how the Islamic State uses it. So this is, um, this is just a, a group chat of Islamic State supporters, but the official communication comes through these things here. So that's the uh, Nasha news agency. And all official Islamic State propaganda that you ever see or hear about or see floating around on Twitter or Facebook or whatever, it always comes through uh, the Nasha news agency on Telegram. And behind the Nasha news agency, there are a bunch of uh, very secret uh, official channels that operate very covertly now. They used to be public, it used to be much easier to get into this part of Telegram, uh, but it's become quite inhospitable to the Islamic State over the last couple of years. So it has to rely on this network of, of unofficial but networked individuals to support its propaganda dissemination uh, efforts. So on Telegram, uh, it not only acts as a place that you can look at media being released, it also aggregates it and archives it. So this is uh, one day back in July uh, of this year, just one day of photo reports. And, and this isn't the extent of it either. Um, you can see here there's a, a big range of stuff. We've got just generally like a lot of guns being shot. Uh, but there's also some stuff on governance here. Uh, there's a couple of suicide bombers being eulogized, a couple of operation claims. And that's a, an evening digest that comes out every day. So essentially where they gather together, or I should say, I should say all of this in the past tense actually, because it's not like this quite so much anymore. But you still get the evening digest where they gather everything together and they say, this is what we did today. Uh, that gets read out in the radio bulletin and so on. And it looks like this is a poster for a video as well. But essentially this is a snapshot of, of the kind of archival side of Telegram. I spend most of my days on Excel probably should use something more high-tech, but Excel's simple. Uh, essentially, I take everything from Telegram uh, and code it in Excel, make it workable, uh, put it into numbers, essentially, so then I can make uh, tables and charts and all that stuff that tells the story a little bit better than these rambling tables. But yeah, just I always like to show Excel because I spend so much time there. Now, I'm going to talk to you about the output, first of all. I'm going to look at this from three different perspectives. First of all, output, then brand, and then the kind of geographic spread of its media. But first of all, I'm going to look at the output. So this number here, 892 units of propaganda, what does that mean? So what I class as a unit of propaganda is a video, a collection of photographs, so a photograph report rather than an individual photograph. Uh, newspapers, magazines, radio bulletins, uh, written bulletins, uh, datwa materials, so stuff that focuses on theology. I don't include, and I'm being quite uh, clear about this because there's a, a lot of different Islamic State media out there, and there's an aspect of it that repeats 
and if you count all of that stuff, then it really inflates the numbers. But if you remove the stuff that repeats, and the stuff that repeats is essentially the Armark news agency claims, so operation claims, and the provincial operation claims as well. If you remove that, then you can get a better indication of the editorial capacity of the Islamic State, not just how much they're making, but how much they're able to make. So in, that says August 2015, it was actually the Islamic month of Shawal in the Hijri year 1436, uh, which spanned July and August 2015. Uh, 30 days, there were 892 unique propaganda events. So it's about, if I remember correctly, it was about 28, an average of 28 uh, bits of propaganda every single day. Uh, three or four videos every single day, uh, about 20 photo reports, a lot of stuff basically, and also multilingual. The radio bulletins back then were being released in German, Arabic, Turkish, French, and English. Um, not anymore. If we fast forward about 18 months to February 2017, so that's the uh, Islamic month of Rabi'a Atheni in the year 1438. Uh, it looks quite different. Rather than 892, about a third of its productivity was knocked off. Produced 570 units of propaganda, which is still, I mean, it's still tons, right? Still uh, a lot of photo reports, not quite so many videos, but a lot of photo reports, and at that time it was also producing a new magazine that got released in, uh, Ramir this is, got released in, I think it was 10 languages when it was still in circulation. But yeah, I mean, you can't deny that there is a, a drop there. And then if you move forward to September 2017, it goes down again, again by a third. And just this last month, uh, November 2017, actually Safar, in the Islamic, uh, in the Hijri year 1439, it's gone down to 108 units of propaganda. So now it's operating, the Islamic State's media uh, infrastructure is operating at about just over 10% of what it was a couple of years ago. Um, lots of different reasons for that, obviously. I think probably the most important, uh, or the, the most important three, are territorial loss. You don't just need places, offices within which to make propaganda. You need places about which to make propaganda. Back in 2015, when it used to like taking photographs of schools or hospitals, for example, that was possible because it had schools and hospitals in its territories. Now it doesn't, so it can't. So there's less stuff about which to make propaganda. Also, a lot of media operatives have been killed, coalition airstrikes and just general uh, offensives on all sides, um, which overall has diminished, again diminished the editorial capacity of the Islamic State. And I'm not just talking about people like Abu Muhammad al Furqan, the guy who was the uh, information minister of the Islamic State, killed in a drone strike in September 2016. I'm talking about all of the camera men uh, well, the camera boys, uh, often it's children that are taking these photographs, uh, but also the people writing this material, they're targeted. Uh, the editors of magazines like Ramir and Darbek, uh, they're targeted. Narrators of videos, singers, they've been targeted by the coalition as well, all in an attempt to compress the Islamic State's ability to make propaganda. So, aside from territorial loss and aside from airstrikes, is obviously one third very important factor, which is uh, cyber offensives. I mean, I assume it's very important. No one says anything about it. The Pentagon has this uh, task force called Task Force Ares, which is controlled by Cyber Command, um, which is said to be doing lots of stuff against the Islamic State. It's very, very quiet about whatever it does, but I presume that they're behind some of the uh, logistical difficulties that the Islamic State has faced over the last couple of years as well. But essentially, I just want to get across to you that it's not what it once was. It's producing a lot less than it once was. As for the brand, this is another really interesting story uh, that you can tell through XL. Um, this is uh, Shawal 1436 again. You can see here, uh, if you can't read that, the blue is 
war-themed propaganda. Uh, so there's a lot of different stuff in war-themed propaganda. Offensive operations, defensive operations, <coughs> training, uh, aftermath stuff, so pictures of dead bodies and pictures of looted weaponry. Uh, deterrence, so all of the videos where you'd see spies uh, having their heads cut off or uh, enemy soldiers having their heads cut off. Deterrence, that, that's all the, the war propaganda that I'm talking about there. In the orange is uh, utopia propaganda, utopia propaganda. What I mean by that is propaganda that the Islamic State produces in order to brand its governance abilities in Iraq and Syria, in order to frame itself, provide evidence for its proto-state project in Iraq and Syria. And back in 2015, it was Libya and Afghanistan and Egypt as well and West Africa. So when I talk about utopia propaganda, what I mean is uh, photo reports, videos about schools, hospitals, uh, images of markets bustling and children playing in the streets, uh, a lot of melon agriculture. Back in, in that month, actually, uh, there was also a photo report about um, bird conservation in, uh, in Palmyra. So I, I didn't know it until, I only realized this recently because someone asked me about it and I uh, remember, I was telling exactly this story, I was like, there was even a thing about bird con con uh, conservation and someone asked me what kind of bird was it. So I went back to the, the photo report and it was this thing called an Abu Manjal bird and it meant absolutely nothing to me. Uh, but Google told me that it's one of the rarest birds in the world and that Palmyra uh, was home to one of the last uh, breeding pairs of Abu Manjals, northern bald ibises, if anyone wants to do some Googling. Um, and the Islamic State, of course, when it took over Palmyra, uh, it took over these birds, so I guess it took over uh, the conservation of them as well. But anyway, <laughs> long story cut short, the utopia was a very comprehensive image of life in the Islamic State. It wasn't just looking at what people were doing in mosques, it wasn't just looking at cash being handed out or uh, bread being baked, it was everything. And I'll, uh, I'll show you a, a little excerpt of that a little later on when I'm talking about one of the trends that, that's been happening moving forward. This last little slice of the pie is uh, in, in grey uh, at about 7% of all of the media in that month uh, looks at victimisation. So very upsetting scenes and again there's some of these upsetting scenes in this final video that I'm going to show you that I've, I've blocked out so you can't actually see any of the, uh, the, 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 the content. Um, but essentially it's a very, very important foundation to the Islamic State's strategic narrative. The idea that Sunni Muslims in Iraq and Syria, and well, Sunni Muslims everywhere, are being victimized by the enemies of Islam. The way they like to show that is by showing dead children, or dying children, or dead old people. Um, never dead men of military age, it's always children or old people. Showing them in the aftermath of airstrikes to show just how evil, just how criminal the international coalition is. And that's the point where they, they bundle together the Americans, the Russians, the Israelis, the Saudis, the Syrians, the Iraqis, the Iranians, they bundle them all together into this, this one big conspiracy against Islam. And the Islamic State does it, all jihadist groups do it, but the Islamic State does it in a very, very uh, effective manner. It's very good at argumentation through, through videos. But anyway, that was the picture back in August 2015. If we move forward again to uh, earlier this year, February 2017, you can see that there's been a very big shift in terms of what kind of media is being privileged, what parts of the Islamic State brand are being prioritized. So to remind you, blue is war-themed propaganda, orange is uh, utopia-themed, and gray is victimhood. Interestingly, the, the, the victimhood stuff stayed at about six or seven percent of the, uh, the, the overall output for that month. Um, the big shift, obviously, was a lot less stuff about the civilian governance in Iraq and Syria, and a lot more stuff about, uh, about the military side of things. We have to also remember that less propaganda on the whole was produced during this, this, uh, this month. But still, proportionally, the proportions were very different. Now, if we think back to earlier this year, February 2017, uh, that was right in the smack in the middle of the battle to recapture Mosul. 
And the Islamic State communicated very, very proactively about the battle for Mosul. It communicated about it in a way that no other city or battle had been communicated about before, and, and none since. I mean, even Raqqa, which is a similarly important city to, to Mosul, it didn't get the same kind of treatment from the propagandists. I mean, we're talking hundreds of photo reports, probably maybe thousands, yeah, no, actually, I'm going to say probably rather than maybe, thousands of operation claims. And there were, I think, 12 or 13 feature-length videos that were very carefully, meticulously produced. Uh, often, the focus was on suicide bombers, uh, a lot of drone footage, that kind of thing. But, but never before had the Islamic State communicated in this way. Mosul was a, a sea change in its communications. Um, and that influenced the, the brand back then. So if we move forward uh, past the, the loss of Mosul, which uh, that was declared recaptured in July 2017, so a few months ago. Um, shortly after, after that, it was Tal Afar, and of course the battle for Raqqa had been going on the whole time as well. Um, September 2017, you can see that it's kind of the same, but again, war is getting more and more important. It's squeezing out uh, utopia. Victimization, though, still about 6 or 7 percent. Uh, so September 2017, this was just a few weeks before Raqqa was declared recaptured. Um, so that came in mid-October. Uh, so again, I think this is symptomatic of the fact that the Islamic State had different priorities in 2017 to back in 2015. It wasn't showing off in the same way uh, as it was a couple of years ago. It was still showing off. It was still framing all of these uh, military setbacks. It was still framing the loss of Mosul, the loss of Raqqa, as these great victories that will go down in the annals of jihadi history. But it wasn't talking about its ability to govern, because A, it wasn't governing, and B, it had no one to govern. If we just look at November 2017, uh, that just brings it just to a close, just to make it right up to the present. You can see, actually, that there's less victimization stuff. I mean, it's too early to say from just one, one data point what that actually means. but. Uh, it will be interesting to see how they navigate through the next few months. But again, recall that in November, it was only 108 bits of propaganda that were circulated during the entire month versus 892 uh, a couple of years ago. So it's a very different beast now, very different beast. Now for the geographic makeup of it all. So this will take some explaining. Um, this is a map of the Islamic State's media infrastructure. Uh, in the middle we have, uh, and it's, it's derived from a bunch of different things, so just generally from watching and looking at too much propaganda, uh, but also looking at documents. Uh, there are very few documents about the Islamic State's media infrastructure out there, very few documents about its strategy out there as well. But there's one uh, which was picked up and translated by Ayman Jawad al-Tamimi, a great analyst uh, who has a, a wonderful archive, if you're into that kind of thing, of Islamic State documents. Um, and this one in particular uh, that, that gave me this structure here is called Principles in the Administration of the Islamic State. And it breaks down the Islamic State's media operations into three levels. So at the top, we have the Central Media Office, uh, al Mu'assasa al Um. So this has a direct line to the Office of the Caliph. Uh, it is essentially in charge of setting the media priorities at any one point in time for the Islamic State as a whole. So it issues a directive and everyone follows suit. It can say we need that, that or that, and then people, whether they're in uh, Raqqa province or Nineveh province, or in one of these other ones here, they have to follow suit, they have to respond to it. Next, you have the uh, agencies all around here. So if you ignore these three for now, uh, if you, and just focus on the Al Hayat Media Center, so that makes uh, Darbik and uh, Ramir, uh, Etisam Foundation, which has been dormant for a few years, uh, Furqan Foundation, which does all of the statements from Baghdadi or Muhajir or Adnani, uh, Ajnerd Foundation, it does all of the songs, uh, Anershid, Bayan Radio does the radio bulletins, uh, and I mean, it, it does more than radio bulletins, but radio bulletins were what was being <laughs> circulated online until recently. Uh, Naba is its newspaper, has been, 
I mean, NABBA is really impressive, actually. It's been circulated since the summer of 2015 on a weekly basis, apart from three, it's missed three or four issues, um, on a weekly basis, and it's uh, 16 pages every single time with infographics and images and exclusive interviews. It's pretty impressive that an organization which is being attacked on all sides can still manage to produce something like NABBA. Anyway, I digress. Then there's the Himba Library, which does all the theological materials and the billboards and that. Um, so that's the, the kind of second one, which is very much connected to the central media office. And then all of these colorful ones here are regional or provincial media offices. So uh, I'll just go around by, uh, by country. So we have West Africa province, which is Nigeria, Cameroon, Chad, uh, Algeria province, Tunisia, which isn't a province, but it has a media office. Uh, Libya, so there are three provinces there. Egypt, Somalia, these are all Syrian ones. Uh, Euphrates province spans the border between Syria and Iraq. Then we have the Iraqi provinces, the Yemeni provinces, Bahrain province, which never actually produced anything beyond uh, one photo report and uh, one operation claim after a suicide bombing there. Saudi Arabia, uh, Caucasus, uh, Afghanistan, and then we've got Bangladesh, and then Southeast Asia over here. There's a pretty impressive spread, um, and obviously the Islamic State likes to focus on that spread. It, it likes to frame itself as a transnational insurgency that has, well, that is ubiquitous all over the world, that has media operatives working everywhere, that has terrorist cells working everywhere, that is capable of uh, reaching wherever it wants to reach. What's interesting is that while the majority of these were very active back in 2015, it's not the case now. So what I thought would be an interesting thing to do uh, a little while ago was to essentially get rid of all the ones that are essentially dormant. So what do I mean by essentially dormant? Essentially dormant for me is if it produces fewer than four uh, reports, four uh, propaganda events in a given month. So this is for Safar 1439, which is just roughly November 2017. So over the next few slides, if you just look carefully, uh, you'll see what the actual Islamic State's media apparatus looks like now. So if you just notice down here, this is when you remove all of the Syrian provincial offices that have been basically silent uh, over the last month. So it looks a bit smaller there. And then if you remove the Iraqi ones that have been silent, well, there are none. Uh, similarly for Yemen, take away all of them. And then we've got this big arc of generally pretty uh, unproductive <laughs> media offices anyway. Uh, but none of them were active, apart from Khorasan province and Sinai province in Safar. And then, when you have all of the provincial ones removed, how about the central media offices? It's just that, really. And this is a very big difference from what was happening a few years ago. I think at this stage it's probably useful to note that this decline, this, this massive deceleration in production and geographic uh, range, I guess you could call it, and also thematic complexity, I don't think we can just put that down to the Islamic State being slammed at all sides by the coalition and the coalition's partners. The organization itself will have had to decide at some point that it was going to change that it was going to recalibrate, that it was going to have to respond in some way other than just pretending that this wasn't happening. It just isn't feasible for it to produce hundreds and hundreds of propaganda units or events every single week. So in order to respond to that, I think clearly people in its central media office, the Mu'assasa al-Um, whoever they are, no one knows who they are, uh, decided that maybe now is the time to kind of wind down a bit. What's been interesting is uh, on places like Telegram, as the official media has kind of quietened down, the supporters, the kind of volunteer diplomats of the Islamic State, they've come into their own as not only content disseminators, but content producers. So they're producing their own posters, often really badly worded, uh, very bad translations, uh, but, but still, they're still producing content or poetry or 
uh, again, songs. They, they've been, been producing new uh, nasheed as well. Uh, and also just reposting old videos. But essentially, the Islamic State supporter community, the um, Munasirin, they are officially referred to uh, in its propaganda, they have come into their own. Uh, they're essentially there to try and buoy up the silence, to try and fill the gap that's been left by the official media decline. So, as for trends, I spoke about these a little bit earlier, um, but I'll go into a bit more detail now. So, these aren't thematic things, uh, though they, they both have uh, focuses on specific kinds of event. Uh, they're more like a structural, uh, a structural novelty or innovation in Islamic State propaganda. The first and most important, uh, probably in the long term, is a sense of nostalgia. Now, this is something which has been present in the Islamic State, in any jihadi group's propaganda for, well, forever, really. I mean, they're always harking back to the golden age of Islam some 1,400 years ago. When I talk about nostalgia here, I'm talking about it in terms of the Islamic State harking back to its own golden age of a few years ago. And what I mean by that is propaganda where it looks at the pristine uh, utopia of the Islamic State back in uh, Iraq and Syria and Libya and so on, back in 2014, 2015, when it was really at its height. And also, as it's happening now, so in a little pocket of territory that's still controlled by the group, it will literally sometimes even put a um, rose-tinted filter onto images of civilian life or uh, fighters just having a nice time together. It will literally do that. I think it's kind of trying. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's trying because it's consistent uh, across the board to generate this idea of nostalgia, to essentially talk about the utopia that once was, but also it enables the Islamic State to position itself. Sorry if you, you can't say it over here. Essentially to position itself to say, we had this great, wonderful caliphate back in 2014, 2015. I say that, the caliphate's not going anywhere and it's not just a territorial thing. Uh, but, but here, what I mean is, the organization positions itself to say, we had this territorial caliphate, this utopia back in 2014, 2015, 2016. Look at what Mosul was like, look at the stability and the security and the abundance in Mosul. Look at Raqqa, look at how well it was run, look at how uh, nice it was to live there. And then the Crusader coalition or the Nusayriya uh, or the uh, Rafidi or the Iranians or whatever, whoever you want, they came along and they took it away from us. And for that reason, Islamic State fighter who's watching this video or these videos, you need to go out and engage in retributive acts of violence on our behalf because we can't do it, but you in your home countries, wherever you are, that's your role now. That's why you're important. So in this next video, uh, it was released earlier this year from Raqqa Province Media Office, uh, so obviously in Raqqa, in Syria. Uh, the video itself was called Building Blocks. This is just a short clip of it. And essentially it goes through the different building blocks of the Islamic State's administration of the city. And there's nothing about military stuff. Uh, it features a lot of interviews with people, on, men on the street, just randomly interviewed, uh, or workers that were just randomly interviewed, talking about how wonderful a time they're having. Uh, and it shows, well, you'll see, it shows what looks to be uh, quite an efficient uh, running of a city, quite an efficient municipal governance. كل من يدعوه يلقاه قريبا يسمع الهمس بذرات الرمال يا إله الكون جئناك حفاة وعراة فاكسنا ثوب المعالي كل من يدعوه يلقاه قريبا يسمع الهمس بذرات الرمال يا إله الكون جئناك وعرات فكسنا ثوب المعاني
So, uh, full disclosure, that was not the video I thought it was going to be, but it still had the, uh, the kind of nostalgia to it. Uh, this was actually a video produced by Euphrates Province Media Office uh, and released in September, so it's a more recent one than the Raqqa one that I was going to show. Um, and yeah, it doesn't show uh, governance, but it still it has that rose-tinted uh, and very kind of visceral, uh, euphoric almost imagery of the caliphate, of what it's like to be there, what it was like to be there, what it was like to fight for it. This video in particular is quite interesting because of the focus that it has on uh, Turkestani um, fighters, so fighters from China. It's quite rare, actually, for the Islamic State to focus on a particular nationality of its foreign fighters. It's actually quite rare for the Islamic State to focus on its foreign fighters at all in its provincial media office propaganda. So that it didn't, this one was kind of unusual, um, interesting uh, and unusual. So having gone through the nostalgia piece, and again, I'll, I'll come back to, uh, to this a bit later on anyway, the second trend uh, that is very important to the Islamic State moving forward, perhaps the most important thing for it moving forward, is this idea of the media bomb. That's not my, uh, my choice of wording, it's its choice of wording. Taken from a, uh, a field guide that it released, um, it was written by the Hema Library uh, back in, I think, probably about 2014. Uh, but essentially it's a field guide, 55-page field guide, about this size, called Media Operative URA Mujahid 2, and uh, given to propagandists in Iraq and Syria. Uh, it essentially outlines the strategic principles of Islamic State propaganda operations. And one of the things that it talks about, aside from alternative narrative and counter-propaganda, is this idea of the media bomb or media projectile. In the preamble to this book, it actually says, uh, I, I can't remember the exact wording, so this is my paraphrasing it. It says something like, a well-calibrated media projectile can have more impact in the war against the enemies of Islam than a nuclear weapon, um, which is obviously quite a, a big thing to say but not necessarily uh, that much of an exaggeration. If you think about how important propaganda, adversary-facing propaganda has been for the Islamic State over the last few years, the way that it has managed to seize the narrative space and steer the agenda, the global agenda, um, not just in terms of foreign policy, but just domestic policy as well, the immense power that the Islamic State has had simply through influence, rather than actually necessarily seizing territory and all that stuff, through propaganda, through the videos of Mohammed and Wazi cutting people's heads off, through videos of the Jordanian pilot being burned alive, through the hostage, uh, hostage situation in early 2015 when they were negotiating with states, the Islamic State, an insurgent organization, a bunch of uh, guys in Raqqa, well, not just a bunch of guys in Raqqa, but anyway, a bunch of guys an insurgent group negotiating directly with states through propaganda. Propaganda is so important to it. But anyway, um, I digress. The media bomb, media projectile, refers to uh, a piece of media that can either be amplifying an act of propaganda of the deed, so an act of terrorism, or it can be showing something that will essentially go viral because of how awful it is, how abhorrent it is. So the videos of uh, Jihadi John, they were kind of prototypical media projectiles, but also the videos that are released, like the one I'll show you in a second, that are released in the aftermath of a terrorist operation, where they are essentially showing off about, again, the omnipotence, the ubiquity, supposed omnipotence and supposed ubiquity of the Islamic State. These are media projectiles as well. When they're talking about it, I mean, this is, is obviously not uh, a revolutionary thing within uh, the kind of global jihadist movement, but the Islamic State has taken it to another level. They refer specifically to this Saudi cleric, Shaibi, who's dead now. I think he died in the early 2000s. Uh, and essentially their whole premise for the media projectile is that everything that angers the enemies of Allah is a form of jihad. So even if it doesn't cause them direct harm, even if it isn't a bomb going off or a bullet going in to flesh or whatever. If it psychologically causes them harm and angers them and provokes them, then that is just as much uh, 
a form, a legitimate and an admirable form of jihad, as is shooting a bullet or blowing up a bomb. And this is kind of at the heart of how the Islamic State thinks about propaganda on the whole. Propaganda is not just communication, it's a mode of governance, it's a way of fighting as well. It is really important to the Islamic State and yes, it hasn't come up with all of this stuff out of nowhere. Yes, it's inherited all of these techniques and developed all of these tools based on what other organizations have done before it, but the immense amount of resources and kind of privileges that the Islamic State bestowed upon its media operatives in order to, to do what it's done these last few years is, is really testament to the fact that they do consider media work, propaganda, to be a central part of the jihad. So I've already gone through this, uh, and I'll show you an instance of it in uh, a second. Um, but media bombs, media projectiles, whether they're propaganda of the deed or whether it's a video of someone being beheaded with a English or whatever preamble directed at a foreign government or packaged for sharing on social media or whatever. This is offensive information warfare. I mean, it's, it's very clear that that's what's happening. It's not just uh, haphazard making of videos hoping that they'll find a home somewhere, hoping that someone will watch them and think that the Islamic State's very impressive. There's a strategy behind this stuff. It's, it's not just happening spontaneously. Now, the next video clip uh, is not, it doesn't immediately present an Isla as an Islamic State propaganda video, but it becomes very clear that it is. Um, but it was released uh, about three days or four days after the Barcelona attack earlier this year um, from the Kheir province media office, so that's eastern Syria, um, around Deir Azor, which has actually historically been one of the most active uh, and capable media offices of the Islamic State. But the problem is these attacks require just everyday items, just a car, no guns or explosives. And with so little planning required, it can be hard to spot them and stop them. Screams and panic tonight on Barcelona's most famous pedestrian street. 13 people are dead after a vehicle plowed into a crowd. Um, so the, the Arabic voiceover there was, that was Abu Muhammad al-Adnani. He died uh, in, it was at the end of August 2016, but it was a clip from a, a speech that he made. I think it was either earlier in 2016 or in late 2015. Essentially he says, the door to Hijra, the door to migration to Iraq and Syria has now been closed. But that just means that the door to jihad in your home countries, wherever you are, uh, to Islamic State support this is, the door to jihad in your home countries has been opened. And you can see, I mean, this is a, a very typical uh, example of a video that the Islamic State produces in the wake of a, a terrorist operation where, again, it's trying to make the most out of it, it's trying to amplify it. And crucially, this kind of media isn't just for adversaries. I should have made that clear earlier, actually. It's not just for adversaries. This kind of stuff is just as important for supporters of the group. It's a way to keep them interested, a way to show them that the Islamic State, yes, it may have lost its territory uh, in Iraq and Syria. Yes, it may be declining in terms of its, its material weight, but in terms of its global uh, potency, it's still very much there. Uh, so just very quickly to go through the implications so I can get to this last uh, video clip that kind of brings everything together. Um, this is Raqqa, no longer controlled by the Islamic State. That's the SDF moving, moving through. I think there's no two ways about it. The Islamic State's proto-state is no more. At the moment, it is no more. There'll be, of course, pockets of territory in Iraq and Syria where it continues to engage in governance and education and ideological incubation, all that stuff. But in terms of what we've seen in the last couple of years, it's, it's not capable uh, of, of doing uh, what it has been um, anymore. I think that in light of that, its ability to incite, inspire, and direct acts of terrorism outside of Iraq and Syria, and actually inside of Iraq and Syria, will be its new 
unique selling point. The thing that it focuses on above all to show that, yes, it may have lost this territory, but actually still it is the best jihadist group out there and you should definitely join it rather than Al-Qaeda. We could be moving into, and this is very much a, it's a big statement, uh, we could be moving into a new phase of the global jihad, potentially. I don't know. I'd love to hear what you guys think. Um, the next slide, it's a five-minute five clip. Okay, so it's, it's a five-minute video clip from a video that was released on the 28th of November uh, by the Al-Hayat Media Center. It's just the first five minutes of it. Um, and, well, I'll, I'll let you make up your minds about it, uh, but I think it basically encapsulates everything that I've just said, uh, obviously in Islamic State terms, um, and demonstrates that, yes, the group could well be on a new strategic trajectory, that this new phase of the global jihad could well actually be happening. Whether rhetoric matches up with reality is another question, but certainly in terms of its official strategic communication, the Islamic State does seem to have taken this new tack. Um, just again to, to go back to what Reid said at the beginning, there is some upsetting imagery uh, in this. I spent uh, much of last night and much of this morning um, trying to put black boxes over the, the upsetting imagery. And I think I did a, a good job of it. Um, but just to warn you anyway, uh, it's, yeah, I mean, it's Islamic State propaganda, so it's pretty brutal. But, but hopefully it's sanitized enough that you can get the meaning of it without actually having to see the, the bad bits of it. فتربصوا إنا معكم متربصون Neither their men their steel or their fire could stand in its path Allah's promise delivered the victorious group Restoring the Khilafah to establish Allah's rule on the earth and obliterate falsehood as the war on Kufr continued to flare, engulfing the sanctuaries of the Tawahid. Obama scrambled to form a new coalition of enemies, the Ahzab of this era. Over 40 countries have offered to help the broad campaign against ISIL so far from training and equipment, to humanitarian relief, to flying combat missions. And this week, at the United Nations, I'll continue to rally the world against this threat. With imperialist Russia vying to return to the world stage, their hatred of the truth driving them to pour molten lava over its followers in an unprecedented campaign of aggression and lies. Intensified by a new pharaoh even more foolish than his predecessor, who believed he could fight fire with fire. You know, you have to fight fire with fire. This is an evil, sadistic, monstrous enemy. Absolute butchers. Murdering innocent people in what has been called a Syrian slaughterhouse. I'm going to bomb the out of them. I don't care. I don't care. They equated their safety with the destruction of Islam and its people. A war on terror. We're also taking strong measures to protect our nation from radical Islamic terrorism. They fail. Terror, its fuel is war, as the ravenous flames continue to rise, making their way to the lands of the Crusaders. And as Allah continued to alternate the outcomes of battles, the creed of the victorious group 
remained constant. They did not seek to live to fight another day. Rather, they fought to kill and to be killed. For it is through death that this young Khilafa lives. Through death, it remains forever victorious. Until the final hour. فموتي بغيظك أمريكا موتي بغيظك فلن تهزم أمة يتسابق أبناؤها شيبا وشفانا على الموت وإزهاق النفس رخيصة في سبيل الله ولن يغلب جيل همه الآخرة وحسن العاقبة فالحرب سجان والأيام دول والعاقبة للمتقين I mean, it's uh, the, 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 the kind of nuts. Well, it's very nuts, that video. Um, it's not character... Like, we all know the Islamic State is good at making propaganda, but that, that's a, they've put a lot of effort into that video in particular. Because, essentially, it's identifying the fact that the Islamic State is on a new strategic trajectory. It says it. The jihad has entered a new phase. Um, I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me. I don't know how long I've gone on for. But thanks. <laughs>